Well, good afternoon, all. Uh, this is our continuing lecture series in spinal cord injury. Today, I'll be speaking about uh, prognostic factors. Um, hopefully, this will uh, be clear as we continue, uh, but feel free to reach out with any questions as I uh, move forward. <clears throat> so uh, what I'll be doing is speaking through basically the uh, pathophysiology of a spinal cord injury. Uh, talk about the uh, extent and the temporal relationships of recovery after spinal cord injury. And then we'll uh, discuss specific aspects of the international standards for the neurological classification of spinal cord injury exam that uh, can prognosticate uh, ambulation and motor recovery. Um, as we end, we'll talk a little bit about imaging factors that might be able to uh, additionally predict motor recovery and then talk about strategies for discussing um, how do you break the news uh, to somebody with a new spinal cord injury uh, to both them and their families. So we've uh, talked through this before, but just as a reminder, the um, uh, spinal cord at the level of your neck is about the size of your little finger. And so um, as we think about what is passing through, we recognize that you have information uh, going down the cord from the brain uh, towards the periphery and you have sensory information coming in from the uh, periphery and ascending the cord uh, to go up to the somatosensory cortex. Um, at each level uh, of a nerve root, um, you have afferent information coming in and efferent information going out. These are about one centimeter intervals uh, from each other. And you have uh, facilitatory or excitatory interneurons, uh, as well as inhibitory interneurons. This is a very um, simplistic cartoon of uh, pathways through the cord, but you can see uh, an injury to the cord uh, can cause significant disruption. And so as we talk about uh, recovery after a spinal cord injury, um, we have to keep in mind a number of natural barriers to uh, repairing or curing a spinal cord injury. First off, um, because of the uh, ischemia and necrosis that occurs um, within the area of injury, typically you will develop a glial scar. Now remember that the cord itself is about 90% glial cells, only 10% actually conduct electrical um, impulses. And so uh, soon after you begin building essentially in 360 degrees around this um, area of necrosis, a glial scar. So you would have to be able to break through uh, below and above that scar in order to um, have new neurons uh, traverse this chasm. And this is a chasm. Um, and so the other thing that we would need to do is to put a scaffolding of sorts in there. We can do that uh, putting in stem cells or perhaps uh, Schwann cells to create a platform for the new neurons uh, to grow across essentially. But also keep in mind that there are a number of inhibitory proteins uh, that interfere with um, the production of new nerve uh, cells, no-go protein, myelin-associated glycoproteins, tumor necrosis factor alpha and nuclear factor kappa B. All of these are hostile to newly developing uh, neural cells as they go through there. Um, but let's say that there was somehow that we were able to inhibit these inhibitory proteins um, and allow the neuron to um, continue to grow and develop. It still needs to have specific growth factors present um, at specific times and in specific concentrations uh, as it grows. Um, and so let's, let's say that we were able to put together a cocktail of sorts that included those growth factors. Um, the other thing that we would still have to figure out is how to direct those neurons to appropriately communicate only with their specific um, relatives uh, above and or below or uh, we're likely to see significant neuropathic pain, misfiring, uh, spasticity, uh, et cetera, as we go through there. So these, these are the barriers that we need to overcome in order for uh, natural uh, kind of repair of the uh, spinal cord injury. Um, 
recognized that in 1992, the uh, international standards for the neurological classification of spinal cord injury became much more anal. Um, prior to that, we had the uh, Frankel uh, classification that didn't really take into account the um, somatotopic arrangement. So recognize that as you look at cortical spinal tracts, the sacral tracts are the ones that are most likely to be preserved with vascular uh, supply because they are at the periphery of the cord. Uh, similarly, the uh, spinothalamic tracts are arranged so that you have the sacral um, uh, tracts are going to be most peripheral. And so if you have sparing of these sacral components, be they sensory and or motor, uh, you have a better likelihood, that is the, the prognos prognosis is going to be uh, better um, than if you don't have sacral sparing in, the, in those particular areas. So the Frankel classification put forward in 1969 uh, basically didn't take into account these uh, sacral components. And so the original uh, classification for spinal cord injury put forward by Frankel um, indicated a complete injury if you had no motor or sensory spared below the level of the injury. Um, you were uh, said to have an incomplete uh, uh, spinal cord injury if you had uh, sensory spared below the level of the injury, but no motor function spared, um, you would have a Frankel B. A Frankel C uh, indicated that you had less than anti-gravity strength in the majority of muscle groups below the level of the injury. Frankel D is that you had more than anti-gravity strength in the majority of muscle groups below the level of the injury. And a Frankel E is that you had five out of five motor and sensory sparing below the level of the injury. Still important to indicate that the person had a spinal cord injury because oftentimes you would still have disinhibition of the reflex pathways. Um, and so a person would be at high risk for spasticity, for detrusor sphincter dysinergia, for neurogenic bowel, et cetera. And then the clinical syndromes were described as central cord, round saccade, anterior cord, conus medullaris, and cauda equina injuries, depending upon the uh, level uh, of the injury. So in 1992, um, the uh, American Spinal Injury Association uh, said, you know, um, we've got information now that uh, if you have sacral sparing um, related to the spinal cord injury, then it bodes well. That is, there's a better prognosis for recovery than if you don't have sacral sparing. And so that's why we became so much more anal in doing our exams back then. Um, and uh, we changed from the Frankel to an Asia impairment scale. So the Asia impairment scale A uh, is that you had no motor or sensory uh, sparing, uh, particularly in the sacrum. Um, so an incomplete injury, Asia impairment scale B, indicated that you had sensory sparing and some sacral function spared below the level of the injury, but no motor function spared. Asia impairment scale C, uh, like the Frankel classification before it, said that you have less than anti-gravity strength in the majority of muscle groups below the level of the injury, and you have some degree of sacral sparing. Asia impairment scale D uh, indicates that you have more than anti-gravity strength in the majority of muscle groups below the level of the injury and sacral sparing. And Asia impairment scale E uh, indicates normal sensation, uh, motor function, and sacral sparing uh, below the level of the injury. Um, and again, these clinical syndromes were put, uh, put forward. Now, <clears throat> let me just put one caveat out there. Occasionally, you may see uh, somebody come in with, let's say, a uh, C6 Asia impairment scale A tetraplegia. Um, and they come walking into your clinic and you're like, wait a minute, how can that be? Um, well, recognize it's, it's, it, it's taking into account sacral sparing. And so I have seen individuals who had no sacral sparing, but did have motor sparing. And so I would categorize that person as having a C6 Asia impairment scale, a Frankel D tetraplegia in that case. So um, these are just some of the uh, caveats that we uh, 
use as we're trying to communicate to each other about uh, functional abilities after a spinal cord injury. So our tools, <clears throat> our sensory exam tools, uh, these, these are high tech devices. Uh, one is a, a tapered wisp of cotton. Um, and uh, typically you use a Q-tip, just a little strand of the cotton out at the end, stroking one centimeter of the skin using the face as the reference. And so this is the reference. Um, and then you're gonna check um, all 28 dermatomes uh, as you come down through there um, and indicate whether or not uh, the sensation is absent or that is a zero. Uh, sensation was different than the face that is impaired. You would score that as a one and two, you would score it as uh, normal, the same as the face at least eight out of 10 times. There may be circumstances, a person is in a cast or they're missing a limb or something like that where it's not testable and then you just indicate on your scoring uh, that it's not testable. Sometimes there will be a non-spinal cord injury condition present. So for example, a radiculopathy or uh, a brachial plexopathy, um, you score that as you find it, but put an asterisk there and recognize that the non-spinal cord injury condition uh, shouldn't be taken into account as you're trying to determine the level and completeness of spinal cord injury. So that's light touch. Pinprick sensation is uh, being able to discriminate sharp from dull sides of the safety pin. If the person cannot discriminate sharp from dull, if they feel you touch them, but they cannot discriminate sharp from dull, um, at least eight out of, uh, eight out of 10 times, uh, then you would have to score that a zero. No distinction between sharp and dull. If their sensation is different than what they feel on the face that, you know, that is impaired, it can be either hyperesthetic or less sensitive, but that would be impaired sensation. So long as they can discriminate sharp from dull, you could score that as a one. And then you score a two if it feels the same as their face, so at least eight out of 10 times. Again, some areas may not be testable and you put NT when that's the case. Um, and if a non-spinal cord injury condition is present, uh, then you score what you see, putting an asterisk and making a note in the um, in-ski examination sheet as you go through there. So those are our sensory findings. We're gonna list those out for light touch and pinprick um, on both sides of the body. We're also going to score 10 myotomes, five in the upper extremities and five in the lower extremities with regard to manual muscle testing. So as we look at these, um, typically we uh, discriminate uh, those that have less than uh, gravity strength. So less than anti-gravity strength is a score of zero where the myotome has no visible or palpable contraction. Um, a one is even with gravity eliminated, the person cannot move the limb through its full range of motion. Um, and then a two is with gravity eliminated, they can move the limb through the full range of motion, but they can't move it against gravity. Anti-gravity is at least three out of five strength on a manual muscle testing score. So meaning that they can move the limb through the uh, range of motion, full range of motion against gravity. Um, four is they can provide uh, resistance through the full range of motion, but not it's not considered uh, what would be appropriate uh, for an age and gender matched individual. That is normal strength. Uh, and you score that as a five. Um, so again, sometimes it's not able, we're not able to test a specific myotome. And so if that's the case, we put uh, NT, unable to test, not tested. Um, and sometimes a non-spinal cord injury condition is present. So for example, plexopathy, we simply score it as we see it, putting an asterisk and then noting uh, what the non-spinal cord injury condition is. So that said, we do our examination um, and the timing uh, is somewhat critical. Um, some people say that you need to have your first full in-ski examination performed within 72 hours. Um, I'll come back to that in just a moment. Sacral sparing, however, is uh, a primary factor both in, in the very acute as well as subsequently uh, chronic spinal cord injury. 
So if you have sacral sparing of light touch and pinprick, that's a good sign. If you have deep anal pressure, that's a good sign. If you have the ability to voluntarily uh, contract the anal sphincter, that's an especially good sign. Um, so the recommendations are that we perform the INSKI examination as soon as possible to establish a baseline. Um, and this is uh, both in the emergency department post-operatively and then during the acute admission, ideally at the time of admission and at the time of discharge, we would like to know what our um, INSKI scores are because again, that will provide us some degree of prognosis as we move forward. Sometimes it's difficult to get that initial examination. Uh, the person may be on a mechanical ventilator and not able to um, fully communicate or cooperate. They may uh, be chemically sedated and or paralyzed. They may have a concomitant brain injury, uh, psychiatric illness. There may be language barrier that needs to be overcome. And uh, there's also just the inability to participate because of severe pain um, and getting pain management um, on board as soon as possible is gonna be important. But we want to try to complete this uh, INSKI examination as soon as possible because it's gonna give us prognostic information. Again, 72 hours, um, uh, folks uh, would say that that's the most accurate, uh, and yet uh, you've got this post-injury and swelling that may further contribute to uh, more spinal cord injury. Um, historically, the one-month exam uh, has been used. This typically corresponds to the uh, admission to the inpatient rehabilitation facility, although nowadays that might be happening sooner uh, than that. Um, the uh, initial examination does provide a prognosis uh, for what's expected at one year. Um, there doesn't appear to be a significant difference when you look at uh, Brown's work, um, when you look at um, um, Bob Waters and Ralph Marino's work, basically um, that, that window between less than, or between three and three to seven days doesn't appear to be uh, a significant um, limiting factor for prognosis. Um, and we have a number of studies, um, both in the United States as well as uh, in Europe that indicates that that's the case. So what does influence recovery? Well, unfortunately, age. Um, so we know that uh, if you're older than 65 at the time of spinal cord injury, um, generally you have a, a poorer prognosis. It doesn't mean you won't recover, but uh, your prognosis is um, it less favorable than if you were under the age of 65. So FIM scores uh, were found to be significantly lower at 12 months after the spinal cord injury if the individual was uh, over 65 years of age. However, there were no age-related differences in motor recovery or um, Asia impairment scale conversions uh, at one year. So it, it, they also showed, so a couple of studies, uh, and this was Olson and Penrod, uh, basically acute spinal cord injury um, with an age greater than 50, Asia impairment scale A or B were less likely to walk at one year uh, post spinal cord injury um, than for those uh, less than 50 years old. So preserved pinprick in the majority of Lower extremity dermatomes uh, predicts ambulation at one year post injury only for those under the age of 50. Um, it's just not as clear if you're over 50. Um, we also could use Asian impairment scale C tetraplegia um, at the time of discharge to prognosticate. Those under the age of 50, more than 90% will achieve, achieve community ambulation. If they had Asia impairments, uh, C tetraplegia at the time of discharge, as opposed to those over the age of 50, only uh, about 40, 42% achieved community ambulation. So age does appear to be uh, a, a factor in terms of prognostication. Um, what about early surgical decompression? Uh, this was... Uh, um, for a number of years in question, it was not clear if we should wait to let a person become more stable before doing uh, decompressive surgery. 
Um, but a number of studies in particular, this one, the surgical treatment for acute spinal cord injury study um, put forward by um, Dr. Feelings uh, in 2012 demonstrated um, those with acute cervical spinal cord injury uh, who had early decompression, that is within the first 24 hours, were almost three times as likely to recover at least two Asia impairment scale grades, so levels of injury, at, uh, at six months versus those who had late decompression, that is waited more than 24 hours to do the uh, decompressive surgery. Early decompression improves the neurological outcomes in cervical spinal cord injury as reported um, by these two groups, uh, Tara Wengel and Wilson. Um, basically less than 24 hours for complete cervical spinal cord injury uh, demonstrated 22% uh, improvement of at least uh, two Asia impairment scale grades uh, compared to 10% for those uh, who had late more than 24 hours later uh, decompression. And a um, early decompression improves neurological recovery in cervical spinal cord injury, but is inconsistent in other levels of spinal cord injury, so thoracic uh, and, and lumbosacral. Uh, spinal cord injury. It's not um, absolutely clear uh, yet, more research needs to be done. If you do the decompression within eight to 12 hours, um, is, is it better to do it at eight instead of 12 hours? Uh, we really don't know for sure, um, especially for the elderly and for those with central cord syndrome, thoracic level of spinal cord injury, we just need to do um, more uh, research uh, to be able to answer that question. So uh, penetrating spinal cord injury, for example, a gunshot wound, um, you're gonna be more likely to have a complete spinal cord injury than just blunt trauma, um, especially in the cervical and thoracic regions. So particularly a thoracic spinal cord injury is likely uh, devastating. It's gonna be more likely to be a complete injury because of high energy uh, to the neural tissue. Remember that the thoracic spinal canal is narrower, and so any swelling is likely to have a greater um, uh, in influence on uh, recovery of motor and sensory function uh, than in either cervical or lumbar regions where your spinal canal is a little bit larger. You have a little bit more literally wiggle room. Um, and uh, also remember that the thoracic spinal cord is a relative watershed zone. So the vascular supply to the thoracic spinal cord is not as robust as to the cervical uh, cord above it or the lumbar cord below it. Um, so the question, um, do you remove the bullet if it's there in the cord and or the canal? Um, and what they've found over time is that um, Cervical and lumbar spine motor scores are unchanged. Now wait, I don't think I have this right. Cervical and thoracic, this should be thoracic, uh, excuse me. Uh, spine motor scores are unchanged, um, but lumbar uh, spine, spinal cord injuries um, will improve their lower extremity motor scores by more than 12 points. Um, and again, that's because the lumbar canal uh, is wider, you have more wiggle room, you have a better vascular supply to the lumbar cord, and the cauda equina is uh, less likely to be damaged than the cord itself. So again, cervical, and this should be thoracic, uh, excuse me, cervical and thoracic spine motor scores are unchanged with bullet removal, but you do see improvements with lumbar uh, spinal cord bullet removal. So let's talk about the natural recovery for traumatic spinal cord injuries. Um, <clears throat> most, uh, the most rapid recovery occurs within the first three months uh, after a spinal cord injury. And most individuals uh, will have the majority of recovery within six to nine months. Neurological recovery usually plateaus at 12 to 18 months. That, uh, Steve Kirschbloom reported out um, in some individuals, late neurological recovery, how late? More than two to five years post spinal cord injury. So there appears to be some uh, improvements for some individuals. 
Um, however, usually neurological recover, recovery plateaus at 12 to 18 months. Um, the initial Asia impairments uh, scale grade is associated with uh, motor recovery. Um, so that if you have an Asia impairment scale C, you're more likely to recover motor function than if you have Asia impairment scale B um, or Asia impairment scale D. Um, and that's primarily because of a, a ceiling effect. Um, and all three of those is associated with better recovery uh, than Asia impairment scale A. So uh, the complete uh, spinal cord injury motor score um, is uh, only 6.6 uh, uh, versus the incomplete motor scores, uh, a change of 24. So a person with um, Asia impairment scale A is less likely to recover. Asia impairment scale D, as I said above, is less likely to improve because of a ceiling effect. Um, and then we see lumbar uh, spinal cord motor recovery is uh, significantly better than we find in thoracic uh, levels of injury. Uh, so 35% as opposed to only 10% uh, recovery in thoracic injuries. So what about conversion of Asia impairment scales? So let, let's talk about Asia impairment scale A. So this is uh, a, a complete spinal cord injury with no uh, sacral sparing, no voluntary anal contraction, no deep anal pressure. Um, so the conversion to an incomplete injury for those individuals is only 20 to 30%. The lumbar conversion is greater than that of cervical, which is greater than that of thoracic spinal cord injury. Of those who convert to an incomplete injury, especially tetraplegia, 50% will convert to Asia impairment scale B. Remember this is sensory spared, but not motor spared below the level of the injury, except for the sacral region. Um, and 50% will convert to motor incomplete. And that may be Asia impairment scale C, less than anti-gravity strength, or Asia impairment scale D, greater than anti-gravity strength in the majority of muscles below the level of the injury. A complete thoracic spinal cord injury. So thoracic Asia impairment scale A is less likely to convert. Um, and the higher the level of the injury, the less likely you are to see a conversion to incomplete. So T2 to T5, Asia impairment scale A, Tetra, uh, I'm sorry, paraplegia, um, less than 10% likely to convert to an incomplete injury. T6 to T9, uh, about a 16% chance of conversion to incomplete spinal cord injury. And T10 to T12, again, um, because of a little bit larger space, a little bit better vascular supply, uh, about 30% of those will convert. Um, Complete lumbar spinal cord injury is most likely to convert more than a third of the time. Uh, lumbar spinal cord injury um, is likely to have some nerve root injuries that improve uh, healing over time. So you have more space, a better vascular supply, a uh, complete lumbar spinal cord injury is more likely to convert uh, than is either cervical or thoracic spinal cord injury. So what about complete tetraplegia? What are the likelihood of motor recovery? Those with complete tetraplegia usually will recover at least one level of motor function. Uh, so functional, that is greater than anti-gravity strength, is unlikely for muscles that have zero over five strength uh, listed at one month out. So um, not, not a good chance of anti-gravity strength in those muscle groups that have zero over five strength. Um, however, those with uh, complete tetraplegia um, are, are still likely to gain one level of motor function about two thirds of the time, two levels of motor function 16% of the time, and three levels of motor function 3% of the time. And this may have to do with the uh, zone of partial preservation. For persons with complete tetraplegia uh, at you know, between one and four weeks, 90% of myotomes of muscles with manual muscle testing, at least one, uh, so between one and two, 
will convert to anti-gravity strength at one year. So if you have one over or two motor strength um, at uh, four weeks, then you're likely for that muscle group to have anti-gravity strength at one year. Lower extremity motor recovery is unlikely if the person remains a complete spinal cord injury uh, one month post injury. <clears throat> so what about complete paraplegia? Uh, so um, now we're talking again, motor recovery. Most with complete paraplegia at one month out will remain with complete paraplegia. 73% um, um, will uh, have uh, unchanged neurological level of injury at one year. Um, for those with uh, paraplegia above T9, 0% um, regained any lower extremity motor function at one year. Uh, below T9, again, a little bit ba better vascular supply, 38% had some lower extremity motor recovery at one year. Um, and below T12, 20% of those individuals were actually ambulating with conventional orthotics, uh, typically KAFOs and bilateral loft strand crutches at one year. So uh, a meta-analysis done in 2019 demonstrated that complete thoracic spinal cord injury had the lowest rate of conversion that is 10% uh, or less. Um, whereas complete lumbar spinal cord injury had the highest rate of neurological recovery, again, greater than one out of three chances. So what about sensory incomplete but motor complete spinal cord injury? Um, so this is Asia impairment scale B, so that you have sensory spared and some sacral sparing below the level of the injury, but no um, voluntary anal contraction, no motor spared below that. So this represents 11% of the initial spinal cord injury cases. Um, what we see in terms of conversions over year, uh, those with Asian impairment scale B, paraplegia, um, some of those will reg regress, 10 to 20% of those will regress to Asian impairment scale A. Now, is that a true loss of function or is it perhaps that we um, missed our initial diagnosis? I'm not sure. It could have been one or uh, the other or both, I suppose. Um, but about 10 to 20% of folks who are at Asia impairment scale B uh, after, uh, after four weeks, basically, um, only uh, 10 to 20 percent of those will convert to, I'm sorry, will regress to Asian pyramid scale A. Um, about 20 to 35 percent of individuals will remain unchanged. They will still be Asian pyramid scale B uh, paraplegia. Um, about a third uh, will convert to less than anti gravity strength in the majority of muscle groups below the level of the injury and about a third um, will uh, convert to Asia impairment scale D, that is greater than anti-gravity strength in the majority of muscle groups below the level of the injury. If light touch, pinprick, and deep anal pressure are all present uh, initially, uh, you have an improved likelihood of motor recovery. Pinprick sparing, uh, particularly uh, below the level of the injury at uh, three days, uh, improve the likelihood of community ambulation. Uh, this was put forward by uh, Crozier. They didn't report sacral sparing. Why not? Oh, this was before we converted. Uh, so this was actually published in 1991. And then we switched over to having the more anal uh, sacral components uh, listed in the INSCI examination. So we don't really have information about this sacral sparing, but pinpricks spared below the level of the injury at three days uh, improved the likelihood of community ambulation uh, with or without sacral sparing. So sacral pinprick at 72 hours post spinal cord injury trended, but didn't predict ambulation at one year. However, 50% um, lower extremity pinprick at 72 hours was predictive of ambulation at one year, um, meaning that there seemed to be an association between pinprick sparing and motor recovery. 
uh, spared. <clears throat> so what about motor incomplete? These are folks uh, with Asia impairment scale C or D. Remember C is less than anti-gravity strength in the majority of muscle groups below the level of the injury. D is greater than anti-gravity strength in the majority of muscle groups below the level of the injury. For those admitted to acute rehab um, with an Asia impairment scale C, spinal cord injury, 44% remained Asia impairment scale C at one year. About 50% converted to Asia impairment scale D uh, at one year. And if the person had voluntary anal uh, contraction, but that was the only motor spared as the initial Asia impairment scale C factor, 0% of those converted to Asia impairment scale D at one year. If uh, Asia impairment scale C uh, also had voluntary anal contraction, deep anal pressure, plus or minus light touch and pinprick at S4 and 5, um, about two thirds of those converted to Asian impairment scale D. Uh, so again, uh, there seemed to be some improvement if you had voluntary anal contraction, deep anal pressure, and one or both. If the initial Asian impairment scale C with voluntary anal contraction, deep anal pressure, light touch, and pinprick sparing, then 87% of those converted to uh, Asian pyramid scale D that is greater than anti-gravity strength. So what about uh, ambulation? Am I going to walk um, is, uh, you know, often one of those questions that people ask uh, when they've received the news, they have a spinal cord injury. So keep in mind that reciprocal gait requires pelvic control with uh, at least anti-gravity hip flexor strength bilaterally, and at least one leg with greater than anti-gravity knee extensor strength. So this is um, in order to have reciprocal gait uh, and community ambulation, these are going to be essential features. So we keep that in mind as we look at uh, some of these other things. So ambulation recovery will depend on the initial level and completeness of the spinal cord injury the lower extremity motor function, the age at the time of injury, and then what other impairments may be present, spasticity, the person's uh, balance, proprioception, and truncal control. Um, so as we talk about ambulation categories, community ambulation is for those folks who can ambulate more than 150 feet. Um, household ambulation um, is uh, less than that. Um, and yet uh, indicates some degree of relative independence in the home setting. Um, some folks uh, can use ambulation for exercise, um, uh, recognizing that using HKAFOs, for example, increases energy expenditure uh, somewhere between four and six times what usual ambulation would take. Um, and then you have the non-ambulatory categories uh, as you go through there. So Rick Hansen uh, has uh, two publications. Uh, Rick Hansen's up in Canada. They have the Spinal Cord Injury Registry predictors uh, from that. The first uh, publication has to do with five um, variables, uh, age greater than or equal to 65 years, motor score um, at L3, motor score at S1, light touch score at L3, and light touch score at S1. Um, and then they uh, use this to make a prognosis whether the person is likely to recover. Um, a subsequent uh, publication uh, used only three of those variables uh, to predict because uh, you know, some of this is a little bit too uh, onerous uh, to complete. Um, so the bottom line is um, Asia impairment scale A and Asia impairment scale D predictions are more accurate than for those folks who have Asia impairment scale B and Asia impairment scale C um, at one month uh, post injury. And, and that's the bottom line. And whether you use these other factors or not, uh, it's just, it's more, um, you're gonna be more successful. You're more likely correct. If the person has an Asia impairment scale A, you can indicate that chances of uh, ambulation are gonna be less uh, likely, um, those with Asia impairment scale D at one month, uh, 
are going to be more likely to gain some uh, additional motor function and become ambulators. So if we look at incomplete tetraplegia, this represents about 46% of individuals. Uh, uh, if we look at central cord syndrome, if you're under the age of 50 at the time that you sustained your incomplete spinal cord injury, 97% of those under the age of 50 uh, will become independent ambulators. However, if you're over age 50 and you get central cord syndrome, only about 40% of those will become independent ambulators. Um, brown saccard syndrome, remember this is just one half of the cord uh, is affected. 75% um, of those will become independent ambulators at the time of discharge from acute rehabilitation. 100% uh, will become independent ambulators uh, at uh, discharge uh, according to, oh, so let's take a look at when these studies were completed. Um, the first uh, study, uh, the typical length of stay for somebody um, was 80 days, uh, essentially. We rarely have the opportunity to have somebody in acute rehabilitation for 80 days now. The other reference uh, from Bosch <coughs> was half a year, so six months uh, before they were discharged from acute rehabilitation. So keep in mind when we talk about these, um, these studies, uh, that they really probably don't apply now when we usually have three weeks or six weeks uh, for tetraplegia as you go through there. Um, so the bottom line is who's going to recover ambulation? If you have incomplete paraplegia, about three quarters of those individuals uh, will recover ambulation. Uh, for complete paraplegia, only 5%. Only 5% of individuals with complete, that is Asia impairment scale, a paraplegia uh, at 30 days uh, will uh, recover ambulation. <clears throat> so what else can we use to uh, look at prognosis? Um, in recent years, we've been using imaging studies. So MRI imaging in particular uh, looks at signal characteristics uh, and predictive patterns related to hemorrhage uh, edema or no abnormalities. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Um, those with uh, hemorrhage um, are likely to be neurologically complete. Uh, that depends upon the severity. So the, the size and the length of the hemorrhage, um, the upper boundary uh, typically is associated with the neurological level of injury um, that we talk about with our INSKI uh, classifications. Um, Edema present, um, but without significant hemorrhage, uh, those folks are likely to be neurologically incomplete, but the more edema they have, the poorer the prognosis. If you have multiple levels of edema, swelling, uh, that uh, bodes for a poorer prognosis. Those with no abnormalities, so no uh, imaging of uh, a spinal cord injury, are uh, likely to be less severe and more likely to be incomplete spinal cord injuries. So they put together the basic score. Talbot reported this in 2015. Uh, basic stands for brain and spinal cord injury center score. Uh, so back to the basics. Um, a basic score of zero essentially is no appreciable uh, intramedullary signal abnormalities. Um, and so these folks are more likely to have an incomplete uh, spinal cord injury and a better prognosis for recovery. Um, a basic score of one, now you've got some uh, T2 hyper uh, intensity signal um, in the MRI imaging, um, and, and yet it is primarily confined to uh, gray matter. Um, that bodes a little bit better. Uh, we'll talk through that in a moment. A basic score of two. Um, so again, now you've got some additional extension into the white matter, um, but less than an entire, uh, it doesn't uh, traverse the entire extent of the cord. 80% um, of these folks with a basic score of uh, two, 88% uh, will uh, become Asian impairment scale C or D upon discharge. Um, and generally speaking, uh, none of these uh, had Asian impairment scale A. So that's, that's good. 
Uh, a basic score of three. So now you are traversing the entire cord. You have T2 hyperintensity signaling. Um, two thirds of these individuals will be discharged with Asian pyramid scale A or B. Um, so motor complete uh, essentially. And then a basic score of four, um, basically you have macro hemorrhage um, and edema throughout 100% of these individuals are gonna be discharged from acute rehabilitation with a complete spinal cord injury, Asian parent scale A. So imaging does give us a little bit more information um, as we are looking at prognosis. So how do you talk to somebody about their potential recovery? Um, Dr. Uh, Kirschbloom and crew uh, put together a really great paper in 2016 and I'd encourage uh, you to read through it. Um, recognize that we need to respect autonomy. Um, so disclosure and informed consent need to be provided uh, before having this discussion. Um, providing the best care possible, obligation to do no harm, and then the um, social obligation to being fair to all individuals. Treating individuals uh, similarly regardless of other aspects, including uh, social economic status, uh, et cetera. How do you break the news? Um, the ideal is to have an experienced clinician, somebody who's been through uh, a lot of cases. Um, and so you, you gain a little bit more experience um, and you also learn to speak, uh, I think uh, with a little bit more optimism, um, the longer that you've been in the field. And yet, um, sometimes you need to have an interpreter <laughs> Uh, Miami uh, is notable for a lot of Spanish speakers, Creole speakers, but you know I've had uh, folks speaking uh, Russian and Hmong, and so the language barrier uh, is important that you are communicating clearly and effectively. Ideally, sitting at eye level and close to the patient, even if you have an interpreter present, it's important for you to be interacting with the patient uh, and 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 not so much the interpreter. Um, speak simply, slowly, deliberately, clearly, and honestly um, as you provide the kind of data that I've just shared with you. Um, and use eye contact, body language to convey warmth, sympathy, encouragement, and reassurance uh, to the extent possible. Um, avoid negativity, um, although as you discuss potential treatment options, uh, potential um, clinical trials that are moving forward. Uh, you want to describe what those trials are. We'll, we'll talk more about that uh, at another time, but how do you uh, share information about potential clinical trials and whether or not the person may be eligible, number one, may benefit from participation, number two. And then you're gonna to wanna to provide information about support services. So this is our, our psychologists, our social workers, our peer mentors. Um, absolutely essential because they've, they've been in the field for a while um, and or uh, if they're a peer mentor, they've lived it. Um, and so um, having the opportunity to share uh, uh, with somebody who has a spinal cord injury, who's been through the process and seen others go through the process, very, very helpful uh, as we go through there. So that said, uh, recognize that um, the, uh, the psychology of recovery, part, part of this uh, has to do with uh, the uh, recovery of grief. And, and we recognize these are the typical aspects of grief. Folks will go through denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, but they don't necessarily go through in this order. And they might get stuck in one of those, um, without moving forwards to the other, particularly in our short acute care uh, rehab stays. Um, and so ongoing um, provision of rehabilitation psychology, absolutely essential. I mentioned the peer counseling, um, having family and friends who know and understand uh, can also be helpful as well as spiritual and pastoral uh, support um, as we go through here. So, um, I guess I finished uh, right on time. Uh, 
this uh, often uh, precipitates a number of questions. Hopefully I express things fairly clearly, but would be happy to answer additional questions um, or hear additional comments from any of you. Um, so I'll, I'll leave this open for a few minutes. Feel free to speak up and, or if you wanna put something in the chat, I need to look and see. Oh, so far nobody has uh, entered anything into the chat. This is, um, this is one of those areas that you really need to stay up on. I need to stay up on. Um, and so one of the reasons why I go through my lectures uh, every six months before I, I give them again is to see if there's been any new information. And it seems like there's always new information coming uh, about spinal cord injury. So not seeing any questions in chat, not hearing anybody speaking up. Um, and so I will uh, bid the rest of you a good day. Um, I hope that uh, this has been helpful. Um, in the uh, future, uh, feel free to let me know uh, if you do have additional thoughts, questions, concerns, or you want to participate in this uh, type of research. Um, so much for us to learn still. So thank you for your time uh, and sharing with me. Hopefully this was fruitful for you. Um, I wish everybody a great day.